Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listing's photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. Hey everybody, it's me, Steve Simonson, and I'm coming back to you again with another Awesomers episode. This is Awesomers.com episode number 71. So the super secret handshake is just go to Awesomers.com slash 71 to find all the show notes and details. Now today we're, we're doing a little bit of a pivot for you. Uh, so the first thing I want to share with you is that you know we've been producing content faster than our audience can consume it. So in, in many cases, the average day of content output is around 60 minutes, uh, yet we realize that you know with uh, all your business going and all your daily activities and uh, even other podcasts, uh, I can't believe you listen to other podcasts instead of just me, but no, uh, dare I say that there are other podcasts in this world that you're listening to, it's hard for everybody to consume and keep up with the output of our production, our, of our factory at awesomers.com. So we're going to start breaking the show into 15 to 20 minute uh, segments. So even if I'm doing a long form interview like uh, the origin story, which all parts of that are very interesting, we're going to break that into, again, 15 to 20 minute slugs so that you can kind of download it and consume it at a, at a reasonable pace. And our mission is to deliver these daily podcasts because we want to give you something you can uh, collect and something you can count on seven days a week. And again, my commitment up to 180 episodes, we've already produced well over, um, I think it's 75 or 80 hours of content. And of course, not all of it's quite released yet. But the point is, we're going to make this uh, pivot to, to try to make your experience a little easier uh, and try to make sure that the content output matches what you're able to actually consume. So looking forward to getting your feedback on that uh, pivot and just make sure that you know, we're reading the tea leaves correctly. And by the way, uh, I'm, I don't know nothing about nothing, my axiom zero, so it's very easy for me to uh, be corrected. So feel free to let us know how we're doing. You can go to awesomers.com slash contact and send us your, your input and feedback. And uh, speaking of feedback, why not go ahead and leave us a review and uh, let us know how we're doing overall. Those reviews really do keep the team going and uh, kind of make this, this free uh, uh, kind of what do you call this, this free media uh, method of reaching folks and, and leaving what we think is wisdom and inspiration out there in the world something worthwhile. Uh, just a little feedback can help feed the soul. All right, let's 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 jump in today to our subject, and we're going to talk about famous failures. I've been getting a lot of email, uh, relatively new entrepreneurs in the business less than five years, uh, whatever the business is. Some of them are, uh, some of them have factories, some of them have uh, private label brands are selling in e-commerce. Others have stores that they're operating. And I get calls or emails or messages and they say, you know, I'm too scared to take this next step. I'm, I'm too nervous or they don't always phrase it like that. Sometimes they say, well, here's why I shouldn't take this next step. But as they describe why they shouldn't do it, they're giving you kind of all the reasons they should. And they're just looking for me to kind of uh, tap my magic wand as if I have some uh, opinion that is worthwhile and and say yes go forward uh, you'll be you'll be fine and as much as i understand that and we all want to have kind of the support and you know mentorship or advice of others and i'm happy to provide that to some extent my opinion is not that much more valuable it, it's not actually more valuable than anybody else's including the gut instincts of the entrepreneur themselves Okay, so we're going to jump into this episode. Uh, this is an awesomers.com insights episode where we talk about famous failures. And these failures are simple enough. 
Uh, many of you uh, may have already know components of these stories, so you'll certainly know who the the uh, famous people are who've had these failures, and that's part of the point, is everybody kind of goes through these ups and downs and these this general feeling of, you know, am I worth it? Am, am I smart enough? Am I fast enough? Do, you know, are the risks worthwhile, etc. So we're doing this and we're following my standard format of Axiom 10, which is fail fast. And I'm not going to do a whole episode on uh, Axiom 10 because we've already kind of done a, a summary of that in a recent Axioms episode. But, you know, sometimes people say fail forward, fail fast. The point is to kind of just desensitize the, desensitize the word fail. Failing just means you tried and it hasn't worked yet. And, you know, kind of just get over that premise. I have failed countless times. Literally, I can't count them. That's how many times. So, you know, please understand uh, that that is just kind of a, a normal part of doing business. It's a normal part of life, to be honest with you. All right, let's get into one of our first famous fails. So uh, if you're in the United States, you follow NBA, or if in the world you follow NBA, you know the name Michael Jordan. Uh, Maybe just you've worn his shoes. But Michael Jordan was one of the most prolific and famous uh, NBA basketball players of all time. Extraordinary to watch, extraordinary to see, um, you know, ply his craft on the basketball court. Uh, but very few people uh, don't realize that he was cut from his high school basketball team. Uh, and that was due to lack of talent uh, from the coach's perspective. He went home, locked himself in his room, and he cried, right? Now, this is the greatest player, arguably the greatest player of all time. You know, other people could throw in some more modern players like LeBron James or whatever. But he's arguably the greatest player of basketball of all time. And yet he was cut from his high school basketball team. And one has to wonder what. What would have happened if he would have just said, you know what, screw it, obviously basketball is not for me, and just went on with his life in a different direction? Uh, You know, how different would the world be that we live in? Uh, I I wonder about that, you know, whose shoes would we be wearing? Uh, Would they be Larry Bird shoes? I don't know. Um, So uh, another couple fun facts here real quick that, you know, he talks about this idea of failure uh, commonly, and he points out, hey, over the course of his career, he missed 9,000 shots, 9,000 shots. He lost almost 300 games collectively as a team, which, you know, every one of those losses is probably not that great of a feeling. And 26 times he was trusted to take the game-winning shot, and he missed, right? So even the great Michael Jordan had, you know, kind of obstacles in front of him, and I don't want people to forget that. So... You know, that's a very good uh, first example. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get into some more great examples, including Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, and several others. We'll be right back after this. Empowered. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, we're back again, everybody. And today we are talking about famous failures, and we're on to Walt Disney. And this is one of my favorites because uh, he was actually fired from a newspaper for, quote, lacking imagination and having no original ideas. Now, can you imagine the editor who decided that that he should, you know, that he lacked imagination or has no original ideas. This is Walt Disney, after all, who went on to create uh, some of the most lasting and enduring pop icons, pop culture movies, references, and so many other things uh, over the course of time. Now, of course, you know, the company's gone on to do great things. But again, people, you know, can you just rewind and think, put yourself in those shoes? You don't know that you're Walt Disney, right? You know your name, but you don't know what you're going to become and being fired from a, a newspaper for lacking imagination of all things. He wasn't fired for being a bad worker. He wasn't fired for um, you know, not being able to spell well, for lacking imagination and having no original ideas. Irony dripping from those statements like crazy. Uh, by the way, after he was fired from the newspaper, he started a number of businesses, right? And as everybody's like, oh, of course, we know, yeah, Disney, Disney... Land, Disney World, Disney Movies, whatever. But uh, you'd be surprised perhaps to know that those first businesses he started did not last long and they ended up in bankruptcy and failure. That's right. Walt Disney tried stuff, 
it failed and he went through bankruptcy to solve it. Even after uh, achieving kind of commercial success with movies and, you know, on the national scale, uh, even perhaps the, the global scale back then, I'm not sure how wide the distribution was, but, you know, the old movies, Cinderella and, and all those old classics that came out during Walt's uh, original kind of rise to fame, they were already extraordinarily powerful movies. And the entire nation knew, you know, Walt Disney movies. And he decided he's going to open Disneyland. And as that was happening, I believe this is in the mid-50s, the newspapers called it Walt's Folly on its opening day, saying, who, who goes and bulldozes, you know, orange groves and, and puts in this big amusement park? This is a terrible idea. So I, I, I share this to let you know, number one, that some of the greats went through their own self-doubt, went through their own imposter syndrome, went through their own literal failures on their road to success. But also that maybe the other people who are telling you stuff don't know what they're talking about. And it's a classic you know, difference between Ossimers and Normies. Normies will try to talk you off the ledge. And they'll, in many ways, they want to try to help you. And they do that by saying, no, that's a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. Don't take the risk. This is scary to me. It should be scary to you. And so I just want to point out that you know, Michael, Jackson, or Michael Jordan's coach in, in our uh, previous story, he was wrong. It doesn't mean he's a bad guy. He was just simply wrong. And, you know, whoever's calling Disneyland Walt's Folly um, or the newspaper editor who decided he lacked imagination, they're just simply wrong. And I'm not judging them so much as I'm saying, let other people be wrong. You go prove them wrong and you do what you want to do. All right, let's talk about Steve Jobs. This is one of my favorites because, you know, at just 30 years old, he was, you know, absolutely devastated and completely uh, depressed about being basically fired from Apple. And this was a, a time when Apple was, you know, going through uh, pretty decent growth and they had brought on a board. In fact, uh, Steve Jobs had convinced this particular guy who's, who became the chairman of the board that, you know, he, he recruited him for Pepsi. He's like, you know, stop making sugar water, come work for me and let's do something and, and change the world. And the guy that he brought in ultimately later led uh, the board to remove Steve Jobs for presumably lacking vision or not having the, the company's you know, goals or objectives in alignment or you know, whatever. Obviously, it wasn't done just you know, for, for no reason at all. There was a reason behind it. Uh, obviously, at some point later, the, uh, Steve had started another company and Apple was struggling at that point. After uh, he left it, it began to struggle. And they ended up, you know, buying Steve's company and bringing him back in and things got, you know, put back together. But a lot of people don't remember after that kind of uh, reemergence of Steve Jobs back at Apple. In 1997, Apple basically needed to be saved by Microsoft, who infused $150 million into the Apple company. Now, these are two great competitors, right? The two different operating systems. And despite the fact that Microsoft made software for Apple's, uh, like Word and Excel and so forth, you know, Microsoft would have been much better off, uh, arguably, just by taking that competitor out of the loop, right? D making Apple disappear and just staying in that world of PCs and PC clones. But for whatever reason, I think uh, Gates and Jobs had a, a cordial, if not uh, collegial relationship. And Jobs basically said, we need this help. And Gates, Bill Gates stepped up and uh, helped infuse that $150 million that really did save Apple. So that was another point, you know, even after that termination that Jobs kind of had to, you know, go, uh, you know, out of the fire back into the frying pan. And then he was able to, you know, kind of put more of his um, uh, ideas and the company was able to have a little bit of a respite. A lot of people don't remember that the iPad was called the worst product name ever. So this is after the iPhone uh, had already been uh, released. They said the iPad was the stupidest name ever. And they called it, you know, all kinds of, um, of dumb, basically. <laughs> and once again, these, the people writing these columns and, and writing these things don't know what they're talking about because it worked out okay. A lot of people don't forget that the original iPhones had problems. This is so-called antenna gate, where the iPhone 4, if you held your hand over it too much, the antenna would be reduced uh, receptivity. And that was obviously not good for people who wanted to make and take phone calls. 
and they called it antenna gate and they're like oh this was you know the the smartphone thing you know that's cool but you know it doesn't work fundamentally so uh that was you know another you know quote unquote failure that they had to deal with that steve jobs literally had to deal with and i remember him standing on stage basically going hey nothing's perfect you know sometimes calls don't go through more or less um rationalizing that you know we shouldn't expect our technology to be perfect despite the fact that apple strives to have that that feeling of uh extraordinary user experience right where you don't have to think about the technology you just use it and it just works so that's you know again just something to reflect on uh finally you know one of the things that steve jobs did is he literally used death as a reason to never fear failure he called it the single best invention in life basically saying hey you know the the man with the the sickles you know coming uh death is coming so may make today worthwhile and at the end of the day he would ask himself you know is today a day i'm proud of you know is today a day that you know was worthwhile to me and i think that's a pretty good lesson for awesomers out there all right let's jump into oprah now she you know very famous uh and has gone on to do movies and tv and all kinds of things but she was, in fact, demoted from her job as a news anchor as, quote, wasn't fit for television, right? And again, when you talk about irony, give me a break. This is an extraordinary, accomplished woman who has really scaled the heights of TV that I think are unrivaled. I don't know of another personality on television who, um, and even into the movies, who's more famous and more impactful and exerts more influence over the world than Oprah Winfrey Yet somebody somewhere decided that as a news anchor, she wasn't fit for television. And, you know, there's a common thread in these stories that, you know, each of these people, each of these now extraordinarily successful people had to face somebody looking them in the eye and going, you know what? You're not good enough. You're not worth it. You're not going to make it. And these people didn't stop. You know, I'm sure that there were times, again, where they were depressed or down or whatever, but they picked themselves up and they carried on. And that's that's part of the point. That's what awesomers do. Uh, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into some more fun stuff. You're going to love it. Be right back after this. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. Okay, we're back again, everybody, and we're moving on to the Beatles. Now, the Beatles were famously rejected by Decca Recording Studios, who said, again, quote, we don't like their sound, and, quote, they have no future in show business. And again, today, we're like, but that's the Beatles, right? It's so obvious to us. But somebody who was in a position of power and a position, really, of understanding of an industry made that proclamation that, you know, don't like their sound, they have no future in show business. And that kind of uh, rejection must have been devastating. In fact, they almost broke up after that rejection. The, the band almost literally, you know, broke up and just went, went their own separate ways. Can you imagine, you know, again, how would the world be different if they had taken that, that rejection as a permanent failure instead of just a, a smack in the face that they need to shake off and, and carry on with their lives? So, you know, one of the things people also don't realize about the Beatles is by the time they caught their big break in 1964, they had already played together as a group 1,200 times. And these were generally uh, live shows that they did either in their local area or down in Germany, where they would literally do two to sometimes three shows a night uh, where they would just sit there and play. And this was not, you know, hey, the Beatles are here, come and see the Beatles. No, this was like... Hey, you're in a bar, and these guys in the corner are playing music. Hope you like it. It's free, right? So that that's how they, they busted their chops early on. That's how they got good. That's how they they went through their, their process of learning. And as the book Out, The Outliers uh, by Malcolm Gladwell talks about, in fact, this was one of the ways that they got their 10,000 hours of experience. Whether you agree with that premise that 10,000 hours can make you a world-class expert or not, it worked in their case. And it's undeniable that they definitely had the skills. 
All right, let's move on to another one of my favorites, Albert Einstein. So uh, a lot of people talk about this idea that he wasn't able to be verbal until he was nearly four years old. And one of his teachers, I believe it was around seven, basically told his, his mom that he would never amount to much. And, you know, what? first of all, what kind of a jerk tells that to a parent, right? <laughs> this kind of uh, attitude, I, I don't have a great deal of uh, empathy for to begin with. So don't be a jerk teacher. Uh, but whoever it was, uh, was wrong, quite wrong. So a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Albert Einstein, along his way, he excelled at math but struggled at French and chemistry. He dropped out of school at the age of 15. Uh, he also dropped his citizenship in Germany and became a stateless man. Uh, a lot of people don't realize when he first uh, tried to apply for college entrance exam, he failed, right? He was not able to get into college because he failed the college entrance exam. At, at the age of 20, his, his math professor, his favorite subject, math, referred to him as a lazy dog. <laughs> I would just – now, and I don't think it was that cool, hey, dog, uh, how you doing, dog? I think it was like you're a lazy dog, right? It was, a, it was a, definitely an insult, not one of those cool, cool hip kid things. Uh, at 21, he graduated. Albert Einstein graduated near the bottom of his class. Not the top, the bottom. And he was the only one in his class, his graduating class, with no job offer. Kind of, um, I'm not sure depressed is the right word, but certainly out of options, he tried to join the military and he failed his physical. Right? And at the end, you know, after becoming quite famous and after, you know, putting his theory of relativity and becoming a world class thinker and, uh, you know, mathematician where, that everyone respects. That took many, many years, but near the end of his life, he said uh, something to this effect, quote, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious, right? And, you know, talk about soft selling, you know, brilliance. It, it really is a classic awesome move to, you know, just be modest and say, hey, I just, I'm passionately curious about things. And so I want to just keep finding the answers. And he, he faced so much adversity, just like you may be listening at home. We all face adversity. Don't let your setbacks, temporary setbacks, stand in your way. When, they, when you're going through them, they feel like the worst ever. And I, I will share some rock-bottom stories with you in the future. But I will tell you, it's just temporary. Go outside. The sun still shines or the rain still falls. Whatever it is, the world keeps going around. Don't get caught up in your head. Albert Einstein also said, If you've never failed, you've never tried anything new. And that is uh, certainly one of my favorite uh, types of sayings because one of my axioms, I forget the number, is it'll never work the first time, right? And that's, that's part of failure. Just expect it and be comfortable with it and, and know that if you want to get good at something, it'll take some time and the application of knowledge and skill and the accumulation of skill, the accumulation of knowledge. All those become equity points in your brain and in your life. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's professional or personal. All of it can become equity. All right, everybody. This, again, Osmers episode number 71. So go to awesomers.com slash 71 to find out uh, more about the uh, famous failures, see the show notes, transcripts, what have you. Uh, that definitely is uh, always good when, when people go to the website. They kind of check out the episodes. That tells Google we're cool. And uh, it's okay to tell Google we're cool because then they promote the site on SEO and other things. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you remember my comments in the beginning about us pivoting into these shorter episode formats. So even the long-form interviews will be broken up into two or three chunks depending on the time. And this has been another Awesomers episode produced just for you. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals, congratulations on your success to date. Your creativity, strategic vision, problem solving, and discipline have allowed you to build your own e-commerce business. Wouldn't it be great if you had more time to focus on the things that truly drive the sales and growth of your company? Instead of getting lost in a dozen different services and countless spreadsheets, what if there was one system that connected to your Amazon account and automatically gave you the information that you needed to make great decisions and really impact your business? Parsimony ERP can do that. Parsimony is the business operating system for your marketplace business. With Parsimony, you get true double entry bookkeeping, easy financial statements, full customer service tools, and 
item by item profitability, along with project and task management, and more features are being added all the time. Learn more at parsimony.com. That's parsimony, P A R S I M O N Y.com. Parsimony.com. We've got that. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers Podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Awesomers.com.